Part 1 Chapter 1 Wake up, Link. Open your eyes. The voice pierced the black, like a golden arrow. Where before, there had been nothing but darkness and silence, suddenly there was light, sound, awareness. Open your eyes. Slowly, he obeyed the voice. The darkness gave way to a soft, blurry blue light. Open your eyes. The light coalesced focused. He saw. What he saw, he was not sure, but he saw something. A dome of strange metal and blue lights, unfamiliar, foreign. Wake up, Link. There was more than a dome. He was on his back, lying in a pool of softly glowing blue liquid. His back rested on a hard surface leaving his face above the surface of the fluid. The strangely ethereal liquid began to drain, drawing away from his body and leaving him feeling chilled. His eyes moved slowly at first, taking in the glowing dome and then the larger chamber he was in. The ceiling and walls were some kind of stone or metal. They weren't smooth. Instead, they were covered with swirling patterns, ripples and wrinkles in the walls that formed circular shapes and strangely maze-like designs. Small lights interspersed around the chamber on the walls emanated a soft orange light. They looked like stars in the night sky. Slowly, he sat up, but as he did so, his body protested. He felt stiff, heavy. He looked down at himself and absently noted that his body was unclothed. He was naked. He considered this frowning. Why was he naked? He should be wearing clothes, shouldn't he? His thoughts came sluggishly. He swung his legs over the lip of the now empty basin he had been lying in and eased himself out. Again, his body protested, as if it was not used to such simple acts as moving. Perhaps it wasn't. Why was he here? What was this place? His feet touched the ground, stone, cold. His feet felt tender, soft. He eased himself up to stand, and his spine popped and crackled audibly as he straightened. Once upright, he took better stock of himself. Two arms, two legs, thin yet muscular. He reached up, feeling at his head. Long hair fell down around his shoulders. He grabbed a lock of it and brought it to his face. Dirty blonde. All as it should be. Right? He released his hair and looked around again, narrowing his eyes. He did not immediately see an exit out of the round chamber with the strangely patterned walls. He did, however, see a small pedestal that glowed with a light similar to that of the pool he had been lying in. He walked toward this pedestal, and as he approached, he found that its surface was covered with patterns similar to those on the walls. They glowed blue rather than orange. There was a small recess in the center of the pedestal, and he frowned at what looked like a small rectangular object within it. Seeing no other options, he reached out to touch it, but before his fingers could brush its surface, the lights on the pedestal flashed, and it made a sound like stone grinding against stone. He stepped back, startled, as an inner ring in the pedestal rose up several finger widths, and the strange rectangular object suddenly stood up on its end. It was illuminated by the pedestal now, and he could see what looked like a stylized eye on its surface. The iris glowed a brilliant blue, while three pointed eyelashes glowed orange above it. Beneath the eye stretched a single teardrop. Additional lines of orange light glowed softly along its top and bottom edges. Take it, a feminine voice said. He released a hoarse cry and stumbled back, eyes wide, looking around for the woman that had spoken. He couldn't see anyone else in the chamber with him, 
but his eyes fell on the strange pool he had been lying in. Perhaps the woman who had spoken hid behind it? He slowed his breathing, and slowly crept around the outside of the room looking for any sign of movement. Link, I am not with you at the moment, said the voice. This time, he detected something new from it. It sounded distant and did not appear to originate from behind the pool. He continued around the room regardless. Only once he had completed his circumference around the room did he respond. Where? His voice came out as a rasp, and he cleared his throat. Where are you? I am speaking to your mind from far away, she said. He frowned. The voice didn't just sound distant. It sounded... He tentatively plugged his ears with his fingers, trying to block out the sound of the voice. When she spoke again, her tone betrayed amusement. I am communicating with you mentally. That will most certainly not help. He lowered his hands and opened his mouth to respond, but she spoke again. I will explain more soon, I promise. As much as I can. But for now, take the object upon the pedestal. It is called the Sheha Slate, and I believe it will help you. He looked around once more for the voice, but now that he was listening for it, he was aware that he was not hearing it, at least not with his ears. Somehow, he could hear the woman in his mind. His eyes fell back on the object, the Sheha Slate, as she had called it, and after a moment's consideration, he reached out and picked it up. Frowning down at it, he turned it over in his hands, surprised to find the back side of it to be smooth and black, like polished stone. A new sound filled the chamber now, and he looked up quickly for its source. He found it a moment later, as his eyes fell on the wall near him. The orange light from the room illuminated what he had originally thought to be just another swirl in the wall's pattern, but now he saw it to be an archway. At least, now it was an archway. As he watched, the section of the wall that had previously occupied the center of the arch now rose into the stone above. It rumbled loudly as it rose until it stopped with a reverberating thud. Where there had been solid wall before, now a simple arch opened into another, smaller chamber. He approached the arch carefully, looking around in wonder. He touched the stone, finding it to be simple and solid. There was no sign that a wall even existed here before. Before he could voice his wonder, however, he heard the woman speak again. I cannot tell you how happy I am to see you again, Link. See? At once his nakedness seemed much more pressing. He straightened his back and looked around a final time, looking for the source of the voice. The woman, that seemed able to both see and speak to him without being physically present. From within his mind, he heard what might have been a chuckle, and he grew aware that he had instinctively covered up his nakedness with the Shia slate. Feeling his face warm with the blush, he looked around the new room and was delighted to see what appeared to be a bundle of clothes draped over a similar pedestal in this room this one glowing orange. Not caring where they came from, or who left them there, he quickly crossed over and grabbed the clothes, setting the Shia slate down on the pedestal. A shirt and trousers. He quickly donned these, trousers first, and was pleased to find they fit him well enough, if a little loose around the waist. The trousers came with a simple rope belt, however, which he cinched up. As he pulled his head through the neck of the shirt, he was surprised to see that the pedestal's light had turned blue. The Shiha slate had changed as well. The smooth black surface, which he had assumed to be some kind of stone, now showed a glowing blue eye in its center, similar to the eye on its opposite side. He pulled his arms through the sleeves of the shirt and reached out, taking the slate. The pedestal flashed briefly at another doorway. This one in the wall opposite the door he'd entered from began to open. A shaft of bright light streamed in from under the door as it lifted. As the door rose, he glanced back down at the Shia slate, surprising to see the blue text written across the smooth black surface. It read, Shia slate confirmed. 
The text remained for another few moments before disappearing. He placed the Shiha slate back down on the pedestal, watching it carefully for a moment before he bent down and placed his feet into the boots that he'd only just seen. They fit surprisingly well. His boots in place, he grabbed the Shiha slate again and approached the now open doorway. He felt a stab of excitement as he saw the mouth of the cave some distance down what appeared to be a simple passage with rock walls. He broke into a run. He splashed through a shallow puddle, but he didn't care about the water that soaked through his pant legs. He didn't know why he'd woken up in that chamber. He couldn't remember where he was. He couldn't remember what had led his falling to sleep in such a location. He couldn't remember... He couldn't remember anything. He stopped short, eyes growing wide in alarm. He looked around, looking for anything recognizable, as his heart raced in his chest and his breaths came in short, rapid births. In front of him, he could see the brilliant light of day streaming in through the cave entrance, too bright to make out any details beyond the faint outline of vegetation. Behind him, the mysterious chamber remained open and dim. Where was he? Why was he here? Who was he? Link. The voice. The woman. She had called him that before. Was that his name? He whirled once again, hoping that he would see her this time. She continued in her gentle voice. I know you must have many questions, and I promise that answers will come in time. She sounded more distant now. Strained. I have arranged for a guide to help you get started. Please, you must keep moving. Stillness filled the cavern as the woman's voice faded. He finally found his voice again, speaking rapidly. I... Hello? He called. Please? Are you there? Where am I? I don't... I don't remember. Silence. He continued. You said Link. Is that my name? What's happening? But she did not respond, despite his pleas. She had left him, it would seem. He, Link, she had called him, closed his eyes tightly, shutting out the light streaming into the cave. He couldn't remember anything. Not his name, nor where he came from. Nor where he was or how he came to be here. How could that be? He remained still for several minutes as he strained against the hole in his mind where he felt his memories should be. Finally, he latched upon the last thing the voice had said. A guide. He had to find the guide. Link's eyes shot open and he took a step forward. And then another. He entered the light streaming in from the cave's entrance and lifted his hand to shield his eyes, blinking rapidly as they adjusted. As the light grew less oppressive... He found himself at the foot of a grassy hill. His eyes followed the hill as it rose until it terminated in what appeared to be a cliff. Beyond that, his eyes widened, and he broke into another run, climbing the hill and reaching its zenith. His breath caught as a lump of emotion lodged in his throat. Before him stretched majesty. The land before him was lush and green, with forests and plain as far as the eye could see. Distant in the west were a series of brown plateaus, and north from there, a mountain range covered in snow and ice. To the northeast, hazy in the distance, a massive-looking volcano stood, magma forming jagged red-orange lines down its sides. A verdant expanse of grass, hills, and bodies of water lay between it all, surrounded on all sides by mountains and ridges. Directly north, across the field, stood a solitary castle, with a central spire rising above several others. Birds flew overhead, their small shadows passing over Link, as they chirped merrily in the warm sun. A breeze blew past him, bringing the fresh scents of grass, trees, and flowers. The grass under his feet was cool and wet, sparking with dew. As he took in the view before him, he became aware that his immediate surroundings were not level with the remaining world around him. At the bottom of the rocky cliff he stood on, a large forest stretched out until it terminated at another abrupt cliff. 
It was difficult to tell from his vantage, but it appeared that he was on a very large plateau, topped with fields and forests that didn't seem all that different than the others he saw far away. He gazed around at his more immediate surroundings. Behind him was the cave he'd awoken in, nestled into the base of yet another sheer cliff base. To his right, the east, he spotted a large stone structure. It appeared to be some kind of religious temple, set upon the top of another hill, with a single steeple placed at the front of a large, otherwise rectangular building. He stared at this building with the hope of finding something, anything familiar about it. It was an old structure. Green vines grew up along its grey stone walls, and the wooden roof was faded and broken in places. Before the temple stood the ruins of some old buildings. Whether they were houses, or additional places of worship, he couldn't tell. Should he have recognized this temple? Was this his land? Or did he struggle to recognize anything, because he was far from home? After a minute of studying the dilapidated temple, he decided that he had no choice but to start there. He began down the hill and towards the distant structure. As he walked, he passed a grove of trees in the shadow of the cliff. His presence disturbed a rabbit that had been among the trees, and it rushed into cover of a bush. He eyed the bush for a time and found himself wondering if he would need to hunt for sustenance while on this plateau. He placed a hand against his stomach. He was hungry. Seeking to distract himself from the sudden onslaught of hunger pangs, he lifted the Shiha slate to his face, frowning at the somewhat bulky device. He turned it over in his hands and determined that the smooth, black surface with the glowing blue eyes was likely the front of the device. However, he could not exactly tell what it was supposed to do. He recalled that the writing had briefly appeared on it earlier, but he had no clues as to what that meant. Now, however, it seemed to do nothing. He did manage to find a hook on one end of it that could attach to his belt, freeing up both of his hands. Grateful for that, he looked up as he passed under an overhang, squinting at the white clouds overhead. That's when he heard someone chuckling behind him. Link whirled, muscles growing tense. His left hand closed into a fist, and he felt the sudden longing to have something with which to defend himself in that hand. Even a stick, like the simple tree branches on the ground that he had passed by, would be preferable to nothing. When his eyes fell on the source of the sound, however, he wasn't certain if he should feel threatened or not. On the ground, before a small cook fire, sat an older man in heavy cloak. He was certainly a large man, with large arms and a bushy white beard extending halfway down his chest, and would tower over Link had he been standing. How would Link miss seeing him as he passed by? The old man's blue-green eyes crinkled with mirth, which helped Link relax some. Why, hello, and well met, stranger. It's rather unusual to see another soul in these parts. His voice was a deep baritone, and seemed more refined than his rough-shed appearance would have suggested. What brings a young man such as yourself to a place such as this? He looked Link up and down, and raised his eyebrow and his old clothing and disheveled appearance. He looked back up at Link's face and in such a state. Link hesitated, uncertain what he should say or do. Was this the guy that the woman had promised? If so, he had a strange way of showing it. On the other hand, perhaps he was just an old man that lived here. Regardless, maybe he could help. I... His voice was still hoarse, as if it had been long without use. So Link cleared his throat again and licked his lips before continuing. Where am I? What is this place? Who are you? He barely stopped himself from asking. Who am I? The old man raised an eyebrow. We are currently upon the Great Plateau, at the center of Hyrule. In fact, according to legend, the Kingdom of Hyrule was born upon this plateau. He stood with a groan, using a wooden staff to help himself up, and then made his way around the fire towards Link. Link stepped back warily but the man nearly gave him a curious look. The man stopped just out from under the overhang of the rock. He motioned toward the temple and the ruins surrounding it. That temple was once called the Temple of Time. Long ago, it was the center of worship for the land. However, when the kingdom... He paused, considering his words, and his expression changed, growing crestfallen. Ever since the decline of the kingdom... 
It has been abandoned. Forgotten. Link looked back towards the Temple of Time, frowning. Hyrule, Temple of Time, the decline of the kingdom. None of these words or phrases meant anything to him. Even the name given him by the bodiless female voice was unfamiliar to him. He had no true knowledge if that was his real name or not. The old man must have seen something of Link's mood, since he stepped closer and placed a large hand on Link's shoulder. Why don't you sit with me, and tell me how you came to be here, on this lonely plateau? I was just about to roast some apples on the fire. You are more than welcome to share in my meal. Link's only response was another audible grumble from his stomach, and a furtive look back towards the old man's pack, from which several large red apples were visible. The man chuckled, and began back toward his spot by the fire. He followed. It didn't take long for Link to recount the events he could remember leading up to his meeting the old man. Though he kept the presence of the strange voice to himself, he explained that he had woken up in the strange chamber with no memory of who he was or how he got there, finding the Shia slate and clothes waiting for him. You can remember nothing of what led you to that cave. You do not remember your past life at all. There was a heaviness in the man's voice as he poked at the fire with his stick. Link wasn't sure, but he thought the old man sounded disappointed. He looked down at the Shia slate attached to his hip and pursed his lips. What was he supposed to do? He didn't know who he was or how he came to be here. What did the man expect from him? The two men fell into silence for a time, and the only sounds were the crackling of the fire and birds chirping in the trees. Finally, the old man sighed, nodding to himself. I do not have all the answers that I am sure you are seeking. However, you are more than welcome to remain with me in my cabin for a few days while you try to piece things together. Perhaps after some rest, some of your memories will begin to come back. The man pushed himself back to his feet, grunting with exertion. Link looked up at him, prepared to respond to his offer, but stopped when the man motioned toward the Shia slate with the staff. However, I am curious about the device on your hip. From what you described to me in looking at it, I believe there is something else on this plateau that relates to that device in some way. I've never paid it much attention. Such matters were always more my daughter's interest than mine. But perhaps... It may hold some significance for you. Link stood and looked down at the Shia slate with some doubt. He did not know how this device was to help him, but supposed that the voice had instructed him to take it. What could it hurt? He looked back at the man and nodded. An odd expression flashed across the old man's face. Satisfaction, perhaps, or amusement, Link wasn't sure. He turned and reached over to the rock wall that they had sat next to, grasping a small wrapped bundle there that Link hadn't noticed before. He held the bundle out to Link expectantly. Link frowned at the bundle, taking it from the man. He carefully unwrapped it, revealing an old worn-down sword. The blade had long ago lost its luster. It was pitted in several places, and other spots had clear signs of rust. Link looked at the man in confusion. Lately, the bow goblins have been growing more aggressive with their territory. I usually avoid them, and they are usually happy to stay away from my hut. Where we are going, however, is an area that I've spotted them in recently. And you look like you will be better at wielding that sword than I will be. And Link, as he gripped the sword's worn leather hilt, found that he agreed with the old man. He started with the sword in his right hand, but it felt uncomfortable and awkward to him. Once he switched it over to his left, he immediately felt a sense of rightness. Stepping back from the old man, he grasped the sword in both hands and took a few practice swings. His movements weren't quite fluid, yet this, at least, seemed similar to him in a strange way. After a few more practice swings and adjustments to his stance and grip, Link looked back to the old man and nodded slowly. Thank you, he said. The old man smiled in his kindly way, and crouched to pick up the cloth that the sword had been wrapped in. Link felt sheepish for just abandoning the sword's cover on the ground, but the man said nothing, simply holding it out to Link again. 
It'd be best to keep it covered until we need it. The bow goblins might avoid us if they don't view us as a threat, but they are scavengers by nature. If they see a prize, such as an actual sword, they might decide to attack for that alone. Best not tempt them unless we have to. Link took the cloth and obediently wrapped the sword in the cloth. He had no way to wear the sword, so he simply held it by its hilt, placing the cloth wrapped flat of the blade against his shoulder. The man watched him with a brief expression of amusement, and then used his sick to break apart the small fire he'd built. After throwing some additional dirt onto it to douse the flames, he turned back towards Link. Well, my boy, let's get on our way. I have a feeling that you've got quite the journey ahead of you. Thank you.